So thank you so much for showing up. Uh, today we have um, Ryan Boswell, a great friend of mine and an expert at all things social media. So I'm really excited to uh, hear what he has to say and teach us all about building a very winning social media strategy. And we're gonna have some time for Q&A afterwards. And then I'm going to tell everyone about the marketing summit at the end that we're gonna be having in April that I couldn't possibly be more excited about. Uh, that all of my friends here have put together. Um, we've put a lot of heart and soul into it. So that's the big announcement. Um, there's a link for Marketing Summit at slopes.com um, for you to go check everything out, see who's presenting, and get registered. So thank you. And big thank you for Story um, for providing the lunch for us. And I want to invite Connor up on stage, the CEO, to tell us about it. Thank you. Hi. Um, hopefully you're enjoying the pizza. There's lots of pizza, so please go get more if you uh, are not full yet. Um, did anyone, I just got back from Social Media Marketing World. Did anyone go to that event this last week in San Diego? Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna share a couple things that uh, I heard often at Social Media Marketing World. Um, there was two big themes. The first was AI, right? All of us in marketing are, I think, extremely aware of everything that's happening with AI. I'm sure all of us are using ChatGPT for one thing, another, one thing or another in our workflows. The other thing that was a huge theme was authentic, authoritative content, right? Everyone was talking about this weird change in consumer behavior where more people are going to ChatGPT for answers than Google. In case you didn't know this, 1.7 billion users is how many people are using ChatGPT. 1.7 billion people since it launched a year and a couple months ago, right? And what the marketers at Social Media Marketing World were noticing was that their Google traffic was actually starting to have an impact from this. And so as they were talking about this change in the environment and the things that we need to do differently, one of the things that kept coming up was the need for us to be telling our authentic stories, becoming an authority in our space, and doing that for ourselves and doing that for the brands that we work for. Um, and story, that's what we focus on. We give you AI-generated ideas of content to create. We give you hooks, outlines of videos give you a teleprompter to record content, and then we actually edit your content for you so that you can share your authentic perspective and stand out amidst all of this change going on. And so I'm super excited to hear what Ryan has to share with us because he is an expert at authentic content and uh, looking forward to learn from him and excited to sit down and share some pizza and soak in his knowledge. Thank you so much, Connor. All right, so without further ado, uh, Ryan, thank you so much for your time and come teach us. Thank you. How you guys doing? Um, good, thank you, thank you. Will you come sit, actually will you sit right here for me? That's a <laughs> um, it's, I, 95% of being back in Utah is great. I did just go to put my contacts in and all of my contact solution is dried up. Um, so moving to Indiana, it's a little bit more moist out there and we have a little bit more moisture, but it's great to be back here in Utah. Um, I'm Ryan Boswell, uh, for those of you that I've not met or interacted with yet. Um, I spent about four years building and working in startups here, and I also spent a year here at Silicon Slopes working as the Director of Marketing and Growth uh, before I joined a new venture and took over as the president of a company called Cold Plunge Studios, which I'll dive into a little bit later. Um, but today, I, uh, I have the opportunity to speak on marketing, content, social media strategy, and how it all ties together into building a winning brand to help you either build a personal brand or help build up your business brand. Um, so I want to give a big shout out to the Silicon Slopes marketing chapter, uh, April, Pete, uh, Matthew's out of town, Nicole, thank you, everyone that played a part in this, and then also to the story team, uh, thank you for your help in this. One more round of applause for them, thank you. Um, 
So as I said, background, um, I currently live in Indiana, uh, which is very random, hidden gem of the Midwest if you've never been there. Um, but I moved out there about six months ago to take over a venture building physical locations doing ice bath and sauna studios. Um, I started creating content when I was about 12, 13 years old. Uh, and I've now, over the last couple of years, as I was working in SaaS startups, I found myself doing TikTok for an early stage AI startup. And that was actually one of our primary customer acquisition channels was using organic social media and TikTok short form video for acquiring SaaS customers and users onto the platform. So I took that expertise, the hundreds of brands that I've worked with and compiled that into the trainings that I now give and share with people. Um, but I'm an entrepreneur at heart, I'm a creator at heart, uh, and it all started about 13 years ago when I was 12. Uh, 12, 13 years old, and I wanted a longboard, which I'll dive into. So my path, I'll go over the path to the present uh, with a brief little history just so that you guys can get the picture of why I work in social media. Uh, we'll go over some past work experiences, content, and then business, and the different ways that that tie together. Um, and also one last shout out to one of my best friends, Levi Lindsay, that just walked in the door. So thank you, thank you, Levi. There we go. Hey, I didn't hear a loud yell from over here. I don't. Yes, there we go. That's the way to do it. He does exist off LinkedIn, guys, I promise you. Um, so my favorite experiences that I've ever had and my lifelong dream when I retire from work and being an entrepreneur, my wife and six-month-old baby over here would probably tell you something different, but my lifelong dream is to go back to working at Little Caesars. And my first job that I ever had, I made $7.25 an hour working at Little Caesars, and it was the best job I ever had because it taught me how to work with people. It taught me that it laid the foundation for interacting with people, creating experiences, which I then took to working at a tuxedo shop, and then I took that and learned, honestly, how to create content by running the drive through at McDonald's. It was a job that I fell in love with, learned how to articulate, learned how to respond to people, how to deal with crappy people that were in my comment section, which they were really just upset that I didn't put four swirls on the ice cream cone instead of three. Um, but I learned how to deal with people at all of these different jobs. Um, and these early experiences directly tied into and led into what I do in social media now. And that was with an emphasis on making people feel something, even though I may not have been the direct translation or passing of the product, uh, or I wasn't the one that necessarily was creating the product, I was making people feel something by what I was delivering. And then the next thing was that I was building these customer experiences through direct and indirect uh, interactions with these people. So my start in social media, when I was 12, 13 years old, I wanted a longboard. All of my friends had longboards. Their parents all bought them for them. I didn't have one. So being the 13-year-old that I was, I had a little Chromebook. I Googled longboard company, and I cold emailed 300 longboard companies and said, I'll make you a YouTube video if you send me a longboard. I'd never had, I'd never made a YouTube video. I had a little flip video camera, if you guys remember those things. That was the best six month run of a company I've ever seen in my life. Um, but I had this, uh, oh, we've got a clicker. This is amazing. And it still clicks. Who said Red X? Who gave me the Red X? Man. Yeah, I like this guy. Um, what's your name? Matt. Matt, last name? Brown. Matt Brown. Careful, you're going to end up on here if you'd. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so my start, Matt, you got me all messed up now. Thank you. Um, my start in social media, I wanted a longboard. I cold emailed all these companies, and two weeks later, a longboard sh showed up at my house. I'd never made content before. I knew that I wanted to, and so I just started creating content. I would go out and film. I'd ride. You can go back to my YouTube channel, and you can see these videos of me. I kept them on my YouTube channel intentionally so I can go back and look at them. But it's me and all my friends in high school, and by the time I was about 17 years old, I had three different longboard sponsors. I had two clothing sponsors, and I had gear sponsors. And my whole thing that I realized was I could get a lot of stuff for free. And so that trade helped me work with a variety of different companies without having to spend the budget to have to pay for all of these different things, which then allowed me to create experiences, become an ambassador for different brands. And so it really laid the foundation for working in these variety of different industries. Uh, and then my, my first big break in social media uh, came my junior year of high school. I was in an ACT prep class. It was snowing outside, and I grew up in Chicago. The, the lowest the temperature ever got there with the wind chill was negative 64 degrees. So me being the intentional 
16 year old that I was decided that I didn't want to go to school, so I changed my name and, and profile picture on Twitter to the school districts. And I tweeted, due to extreme weather conditions, all classes are canceled and they will resume on Monday. So I show up to school the next day, but before I show up to school, I get this notification on my phone in this ACT prep class. I see that the assistant principal, the principal, my dean, the district assistant superintendent, and the district superintendent had all followed me on Twitter. I was like, oh man, we're, yeah, we're in trouble. Um, and mind you, this was like, kudos to my parents, they picked a great school district, but this school district was ranked like third in the nation. So this was not gonna just like roll over. Um, so I show up to school the next day, my mom's telling me, she's like, you impersonated the school district, you're gonna get arrested, you're gonna get expelled. I was prepared for the worst. I roll into school and in seventh period, my principal walks down to the classroom and says, Mr. Boswell, I need you to come over to my office. I was like, oh boy, here we go. And I had this, I mean, I had like a 70 year old photography teacher, total boomer, and he was just like, I saw what you did on Twitter. I, this is gonna be good. Um, it got to the point where my little brothers at the junior high, the janitor at the junior high came up to him and said, did you see what your brother posted on Twitter last night? That was hilarious. So I walk into the principal's office, I sit down, and as I walk through the door, the principal is sitting there with the district superintendent. And he says, Mr. Boswell, it's nice to put a face to the tweet. I was like, oh boy. So again, my mom's words are echoing. You're going to get arrested. You're going to get expelled. I sit down. He says, Mr. Boswell, it gets really stern. Your tweet was by far the best tweet that I've ever seen. I was wondering if you would come help me work on social media at the school district. I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> not getting arrested, not getting expelled, got a job. Absolutely. No better way to do it. So that was my first viral moment on Twitter. Uh, and that then led me to just, I, for a little bit there, I was addicted to the dopamine of getting views and likes, and it was really fun. But I realized that a lot of people can build products. Very few people can build movements. And so my whole thesis on social media has been, how do we create a movement around any product or any industry or any type of interaction or people and community and how do we help them create a movement around that product um, man I love this clicker this is so nice all right so this is my path in social media uh, and my career path fall of 2016 I started my internship working with UVU athletics uh, I spent a year working in their photography and content creation inside of UVU athletics left for a two-year break to serve a mission for my church uh, in that fall sorry before I left I also started a social media internship with the band the killers who here knows the killers so I was on their social media team for about nine months, helped with their management, uh, about 17 million followers cumulatively across three different platforms. Um, that was like my first big gig in social media. Came back after that two-year break, uh, became the social media director for UVU Athletics. I was undiagnosed at the time, didn't know that I had ADHD, dropped out of college, joined my first startup in the summer of 2020. Um, I was the director of social there. Spring of 2021, I started my personal TikTok account. Summer of 2021, that first startup ran out of funding. I was unemployed for four hours, and then I went and got a job at another startup. Uh, and then I was, became their VP of operations. My first day of work there, I had to Google what is project management. Um, so I learned how to do project management. Um, moral of the story, most of the time when I step into something, I don't know what I'm doing, and you kind of just figure it out. And that's the way that creative things come about. Um, but I joined that second social media, or that second startup uh, in a completely different industry that I'd never been in. Started kind of going viral on TikTok, took what I learned in other industries and different companies and started consulting with brands. And so I'd come on with, with Retainer, companies would reach out for a sponsored TikTok. I'd say, hey, I think your marketing probably needs a little bit of help. I work in marketing, would you guys be down to collab? Ended up going on Retainer and then I've now actually taken a couple stock options and equity from companies that originally wanted a sponsored TikTok post. Um, and so that's how I built that portfolio of startups that I've worked with. Um, began, started uh, social media consulting, fall of 2022, I walked in the door here uh, to work and join the team, and I was here for nine months before I joined uh, Cold Plunge Studios, which I'll talk about just here in a second. Um, and this, my, my wellness path is what sparked the change in everything that happened in my life. Um, and this really was kind of the, the catalyst of change for me. I, when I, I didn't know this, looking back retroactively, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I was undiagnosed with ADHD, and I started going to therapy in the fall of 2020. Um, I've been going to therapy consistently for the last four years now, and it's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Having someone that I can talk about, productivity, business, lifestyle, dealing with family, all the different signals and things that you just learn to take in. And so 
after about six months of meeting with my therapist, that's not six months, that's 10 months, November to August, 10 months later, my, my therapist actually recommended, recommended he said, you, you should go to your doctor, and I, I think you may have an ADHD diagnosis. So I walk into the doctor's office, I get a diagnosis for ADHD, anxiety, depression, and an OCD, and my whole life makes sense. If you can't tell, I talk really fast, and there's a lot, million different things, right? And so, like, my whole life made sense in that moment, and I realized I'd, I could do one of two things. I could get stuck feeling down and sad for myself that I had to deal with all these things, or I could turn outward and try to help other people and learn about myself in the process. And so that actually became my entire brand on TikTok. Um, and so I started talking about productivity, mental health, high performance, and different ways that people can be productive, which then led me into building this brand and getting into ice baths. Um, so this is the story of how I ended up at Cold Plunge Studios. About two years ago, I saw a guy do a, a TikTok, uh, or do an ice bath on TikTok. So I went to the farm supply store. I spent a $129 on a horse trough. I came home. My wife, again, said, here's the next hyperfixation. Let's see how long this lasts for. Uh, I did my first ice bath, and it did 5 million views overnight. I was like, oh, I, th I think we're on to something here. So I started talking about it more, and what I realized is my average viewer retention time was like two and a half minutes on three-minute videos talking about ice baths. So I had this captivated audience that I could keep for three minutes and talk about anything. And so we'd talk about mental health, we'd talk about business, we'd talk about productivity, the comment sections would be filled, um, talking and, and creating this community and this movement. It got to the point where about a year after I started doing ice baths on TikTok, I got a DM from the, the kid that sold me my ice bath at Cal Ranch and said, hey, we have people that come in and show us your videos and right now the entire Western United States is selling out of horse troughs because of your TikTok videos. I was like, man, missed opportunity for a brand deal. Um, so, I started creating content around ice baths, talking about mental health. Um, to this day, I've done about 150 million views on ice bath content and talking about mental health on TikTok. Um, I've been featured on profiles like Lad Bible, Tank Sinatra, um, and, and various different platforms. But the, the most interesting thing came about nine months ago when I was actually here working at Silicon Slopes. I got introduced to a guy that has an office building in Orem. Uh, his name is Sean Finnegan, who's now one of my business partners. Um, and he introduced me, there's a company inside of his business, in, inside of his building, that is a software company based in Indianapolis. And Sean and the CEO of the software company had partnered up and started a company called Cold Plunge Studios. And so they knew that I did ice baths on TikTok. Sean connects me over to Devin. Two weeks later, I'm on a flight out to Indianapolis to trade a TikTok video for the grand opening of Cold Plunge Studios. And within a week, they had asked me to come move to Indiana and take over and run the company. And so 12 weeks later, with our seven-week-old baby, we were on a U-Haul moving out to Indiana. And that's how I ended up at Cold Plunge Studios. So that's the background. There's a million things that I could have covered, but what I really want to talk about is how we take the different experiences that I've had and sharing that experience and crafting and creating a brand presence and a brand strategy that you guys can implement in your different roles. So how many of you, have, how many of you are here representing a company? like looking for marketing strategy for a company. How many of you are here interested in learning how to craft a personal brand strategy? Building a personal brand, okay. I just wanted to get a general idea of how to gauge the next uh, 730 slides that I have. Um, all right, so my, my areas of focus that we'll cover in this final section uh, will focus on content, platform, and influencers in three different ways. My whole platform has been organic social media. So I took over Cold Plunge Studios seven months ago. Our session count, when I came on board, we were doing three to five sessions a day. We're now averaging anywhere from 45 to 50 a day. And our MRR is up 440%, and we haven't spent a single dollar on paid marketing. So everything that we've built has been 100% organic. And we've done that through content, platforms, and influencers. And so this is everything that I'm sharing is stuff that I've used on uh, now over a hundred brands that, that I've worked with hands-on and that I use on my own businesses that we're building. Um, so the first two questions that I like to ask about social media, every single social media guru will tell you that you need to be on social media. I'm going to fight them and say that you don't necessarily need to be on social media. Not every single person needs to be on there because there's so much noise on social media that it is so hard to actually resonate with an audience unless you can unless you can actually devote to creating high quality content. So my first question is, what is your company brand? 
Or what is your company? What is your personal brand? What are you passionate about? And then number two, why should someone follow you? Like what, if you can't answer that question, you should not be on social media. And that's just the, that's the harsh reality. If you do not have a good reason of why someone should follow you or your brand on social media, it's not it's not a spot that I would recommend spending time because it's just going to feel like you're spinning your wheels and you're not getting many results from it. So answer those two questions for yourself and, and learn what is it that we do and why should someone actually follow us because that lays the, found, the foundation and the groundwork for anything else that happens on social. The other thing with social media, and this gets down to natural human relations, but people don't do, people don't, uh, sorry, people don't do, holy crap, people do, Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. I need a cheer over here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, people don't do what they're told to do. People do what they're inspired to do. So let's inspire people to connect with your brand or your company. That was like a really bad joke with a terrible punchline that took me 45 seconds to get to. That could have been really cool, but people don't do what they're told to do. People do what they're inspired to do. And so the, the value of social media is that you may have someone's attention for 10 seconds. You may have someone's attention for three minutes. Your entire goal is to help someone feel inspired to take action without them feeling that you are hard selling them in that social media post. So let's define your who. Define your audience. What's the audience that we're trying to reach? If we're a SaaS startup, who are our users? Who's the person that's going to be making the decision? Who are we trying to reach? If we're an influencer or a brand manager, who is the person that we're actually targeting? If I'm a fitness influencer, what's my age demographic? Who are the people I'm trying to reach? Like, Have a very tactical ICP because when you actually get into the posts and the analytics, you'd be surprised how much you can really target when it comes to social media. About a year and a half ago when I was working for the mechanical engineering firm, I was managing about 25 developers overseas and I wasn't doing anything during the daytime here. And so what I wanted to do was golf. So I, I figured out, oh, I'll create, I don't have anyone to golf with right now except for my friend Tyler and we'd go play at the ranches over in Saratoga Springs. You can only play there so many times without going insane. But um, I wanted to create this community of golfers in Utah. But then I also was like, I wonder if I can build this organically and get free golf. So I created a TikTok account called the Utah Golf Club, and we created a Discord community. We went from zero to 100 users in the Discord community, and then zero to 1,700 followers with an average video view of 70,000 views per video. And within three weeks, we had created this community of Utah golfers across the entire state. We didn't spend a single dollar, but what we did is in the post, use specific keywords and hashtags, and then also in the actual video, like you know when you're creating a, a TikTok video and you can like put words on the screen, all of that information is hard coded into the metadata of the post which signals to the algorithm. And so after that three weeks, we took 1,700 followers with a 99.3% follower rate in the state of Utah. And by the end of those three weeks, I was playing golf for free wherever I wanted, it was really nice. Um, but defining your audience, I had to know that I wanted golfers, people that were willing to take time out of the day, and people that were in my specific age range, which was 25 to 45. And then I targeted with keywords using organic social media. Uh, and then also defining the platforms that your audience is on. Every social media guru will tell you that you need to make five posts per day on every platform on Twitter, YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Instagram, Instagram Reels. What am I missing, Fiverr? I don't know, you can post on Fiverr. Um, but the reality of it is, is your audience is probably on one or two, and you probably have time to spend on one, maybe two, maybe three. And so getting tactical about where those people are at, you also have to understand who those people are so that you know where to reach them. Uh, all right, now that we know the who, let's talk about the how and the where. Uh, the three primary channels that I use are TikTok and Instagram Reels, short form video. Uh, general Instagram feed posts for images and long form video, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn has become my favorite platform for connecting with people, and that's because Levi Lindsay is here. Round of applause for Levi Lindsay. Thank you. Why don't you, will you just finish my presentation, Levi? No, I'm just kidding. Um, this is some really interesting TikTok user stats. There's a billion monthly active users. Uh, total monthly users age 20 to 50 plus is 675 million users. So a lot of people, a lot of brands will just assume it's like, oh, all of these people, it's just 18 year olds, it's 14 year olds, they're in high school. It's like, no, there's a billion monthly active users and 600, like 67 and a half percent of that billion monthly active users are above 20 years old. 
that's a lot of decision makers and a lot of people that can actually take action. And then what's even crazier is that only one in 10 users will ever post a video on TikTok. So that means 10% will ever post one video. Now let's think about how many people ever post more than one video, right? So the competition's very low when you actually think about 10% of the users on the platform are creators, 90% of the users on the platform are consumers. And TikTok's so powerful because the people that are just consuming don't have their personal brand and identity associated with it like they do on Instagram. And so you actually get more engagement on TikTok because they don't have to, like, you know, like there's the subconscious signals when you comment on a post on Instagram, it then sends it to the feed and your friends see it, or you like a post and everyone can see that you like the post. There's none of that on TikTok. And so they can be silent engagers that engage with your content and take action. So if anyone ever bashes on TikTok, just take a picture of this and show it to them and just say, the, you'd be surprised at the stats of what's available on the platform. And then the, the top question I get is, how frequently should I be posting on TikTok? I maybe, maybe if I'm lucky, get three posts out a week, which is the complete opposite of what Gary Vee is going to tell you. It's the complete opposite of what any other social media person is going to tell you. It's like focus on quality versus quantity. Create really high quality content that people are going to actually engage with. And don't ever just post a post. If you ever have a CEO that says, hey, we just need to throw a post out, I want you to leave that company, because that was the first startup I was at. He said, Let, let's make the logo bigger. I was like, oh, man, you are a boomer. Um, so aim for three high-quality high posts a week, and don't ever just post a post. Have a strategy behind it, because if you're just putting noise out there, you're going to fall into the bucket of, of that 10% of creators on the platform. How many people of that are creating high-quality content? It's probably 2 to 3%. And so if you're stuck in that 7% of creators that's inside of those people actually creating content, you are now bucketed and you lose that trust and, and verification with the followers that you're trying to engage with. And now finally, the what. Um, I love this, uh, this chart that TikTok shared in their annual culture and trend report. Um, by the way, I'll have a screenshot at the, or a QR code at the end of this that'll have a link to all of these slides so you guys can go back and review that. Um, it'll just be $197. Um, but, you know, this is, this is my favorite thing. TikTok speeds of culture. And this applies to, it, this is platform agnostic. You see everyone doing trends, dance videos, hopping on viral music. The creators that last and the brands that last are the ones that create lasting impact that's not just a one-time wave. So TikTok breaks it down into the speeds of culture, and they talk about moments versus signals versus forces. And these are kind of your like, you know, maybe one to two week trends versus your two to three month trends versus a lifetime sustaining brand like Duolingo, for example. I don't know if you guys have seen Duolingo's TikTok strategy. Duolingo will never go under because of that green bird. I'll tell you what. Um, and then the other thing that's also important, it can feel, it often can feel like you're spinning your wheels when it comes to content creation. You don't know what to post, you don't know what, what video to make or what to post on LinkedIn. And so what I recommend is have four to five people that you follow on social media that aren't just your competitors, but that actually have the exact audience that you would like to have. Find four to five creators or brands that have the audience that you're trying to reach and turn their post notifications on and pay attention to every single thing that they post because those will be signals. If they're reaching the brand and the audience that you want to reach, use them as your inspiration that you can look to for ideas of how to generate content. Don't just copycat. Use it for idea generation and learn how to spin it to your own individual brand. Um, and then the last thing, and this, is, this has been my favorite part of content creation, is creating four pillars. It's the four things that you can consistently talk about. So when we talk about content creation, right, it, it can be daunting to think about, I have to create 30 posts in a month. It's like, well, if we break that down, we have four different pillars. Uh, you know, 30 divided by four, that's not a great number to divide 30 by. Uh, what, seven and a half? Around there, 7.23, something. No one faxed me, checked me on that. Um, but it's around seven posts a month, right? And so that would break down to maybe two posts a week per pillar, two to three around in there. So what I like to look at is if I have four pillars, I'm going to make one post per week in each of those pillars that's all going to be a conglomerate of the brand and the audience that I'm trying to reach. So, for example, for a, a SaaS startup, for a, for a different product company, pillar one could be problems that are solved by your product. Pillar two could be uh, highlighting your team and overcoming challenges, obstacles. Pillar three could be product features, the uniqueness of what they do. 
Pillar four could be the story of building your brand or your company in public. Talking about the problems that you face, talking about an everyday life and vlog and talking about things as they happen in real time. So these are my pillars. These are the four things that I talk about. If you go to any of my platforms, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, short form video, the four things that I talk about are mental health and ADHD, talk about business and entrepreneurship, mindset and productivity. And then pictures of my really cute seven month old baby. But uh, that's, that's a little 4A maybe. Um, but these are the pillars and I would recommend if you're wondering where do I start with content, think about what are the four things that I'm passionate about. There's an audience that exists behind each of those four pillars that you can connect with. Kudos if they all tie together and you can create a community around those four pillars. Right, so what I took with the Utah Golf Club, for example, was my passion for golf and my passion for Utah. And combining those two things together with a community that I knew, that I knew wanted to be curated together. By the end of it, we had people that were messaging in St. George all the way up to Logan saying, hey, I wanna, I'm looking to put together a foursome to go play a round of golf. Who's in town this weekend? And we'd be booking groups to go out and play golf, right? And so it's, if we can create behind these, the, in that case it was two, in this case, it's four pillars. You're creating and curating an audience behind these different passions. Um, so this was my first ice bath. These are three different content examples that I'm gonna share of different viral moments that I had. Um, my first ice bath video is hilarious. It's pinned on my profile. I have a deviated septum, so I did not know how to breathe. Uh, the top comment I got actually was, it looks like he's breathing in purple, or he can smell purple. Um, so it's really funny, but uh, what I got from this video was, I, I nailed this system where I would use the same hook on every ice bath video. So if you go to my profile and you go back to some ice bath content, you'll see that I start the first four seconds of every video with me using a hammer breaking the ice. And so that signals that I'm about to get in the cold water. And so they stay for the next portion of that video. And then by the end of it, we get into a conversation, they're watching my reaction, and we have a conversation for the next minute and a half or however long they're in the video. Uh, and then I use that same intriguing hook and I also knew that people the interesting thing about ice baths specifically is that it's something that everyone wants to try, but most people won't ever try. And so they're willing to, like if you scroll through the, com the comments on that video, you'll see people like, man, I love watching this video from my warm, cozy bed, right? And so it's like people are willing, they're willing to engage in it. It yields conversation and, and engagement. They're not willing to necessarily hop in and take the plunge. And so they'll, they'll comment and have conversation around it on the video. Next video, uh, so that last video did 7.7 .7 million views. This one did 3.2 million views, and this is a video that I call a sprint video. So if you ever have, you feel like you're low on engagement, uh, specifically on short form video platforms, use an eight second video clip or an audio clip and put enough text on the screen where it takes two to three watches to get through all the text. And that'll help reboost your engagement and view count and then conversations with ideas and promote conversation in the comment section. So anytime I'm low on engagement or I feel like my view counts are low or I need to re-spark my profile, I'll use a sprint video and take an eight second clip and put a bunch of text on the screen to have people read through and then ask and, and prompt them to share their ideas after the video. Um, and then, sorry, this last point, the, this video was optimized for what I call silent engagement, which on these platforms is what I think is the most important indicator to the algorithm of a winning content piece. And that shares and that saves. You don't directly see the like count, you don't directly see the comment count, but what you do see, and what I think the signal is, is that if you, sh if you save a video or if you share a video, that indicates that you trust that content enough that you wanna share it with someone else. And so what I always go for is taking immediately actionable, and this video had 76,000 saves, taking content that's immediately actionable to either prompt a save or a share. I wish LinkedIn would let you create buckets of content that you shared, I would, or saved, because I would save a lot more content, but right now it's all just posts from Levi. Um, all right, so this was the most viral video that I ever had, and it was created by accident. So there's a really interesting storytelling feature uh, and, and outline called, uh, it was the creators the, of South Park that created it. Um, they said the storytelling format was instead of just creating like a chronological video or a chronological storyline and saying, and then I did this, and then I did this, create, I was going to do this, but then this happened, and so I did this. So it's an interesting story format. So it goes less of, and then I did, and then I did, and then I did, and chronological and boring, to, I was gonna do this, but this happened, and so I had to take a new path. And that's exactly what happened this vid with this video. This video did 18 million views. Um, I was about to hop in an ice bath and my hammer broke. And so I made a video 
One, I used the, you guys know like the robot voice on TikTok? The really trending sound. Threw that and threw a voiceover on it. But I made a video of me going to get a new hammer at Lowe's. Again, a really missed opportunity to do a partnership with a big company that did really well. Um, but this video did 18 million views and then my retention after that, I would watch and like the three videos after this video all did north of like a million views because people would watch and the comment section below was tag me when the new video or tag me when you have the new hammer, tag me when you have the new video ready. And then people would come on the next video and they'd say, oh man, the new hammer works great. This turned out awesome. Um, but I used that trending voice and then the last one, and if you scroll through the comment section, you can see this, but I intentionally showed my credit card. The only thing that they could see, they, I hid my name, but the only thing that they could see was what my credit card actually was. And that's because there's this trend going around where people will say, oh, thanks for buying me this, thanks for buying me that. So a lot of people would comment and they'd say, oh, thanks for showing your credit card. I went and bought myself a new Lamborghini. I, no joke, I probably got probably 700 to 1,000 comments of different people saying, thank you for showing me your credit card, this is what I did. So I, I actually f I, I, um, manufactured that engagement because I knew that people would be commenting specifically on that feature inside of the video. Um, so this is, there, there are two things that content mastery comes down to. It's understanding how to engage and it's understanding how to do the silent sale. And a lot of companies, especially on LinkedIn, we'll do the direct sale. It's like, hey, great to meet you, buy my product for $15,000. It's never, hey, great to meet you, what's your name? Um, and so if you can understand, most importantly, this, the second one, which is the signal sell, the silent sale, if you can understand and flip the script of, this is my product, this is how great it is, this is the story, you know, this is the story of how we almost lost all this product, then we had to work with a new manufacturer, and now we have this new one that's ready, and you can buy it on TikTok Shop, and it's ready to go, great. You tell this whole story with a call to action at the end, rather than just saying, Here's a highly produced studio video edited, or here's some product photos that look really good with a bland call to action that says, buy our product. It's like, great. Scroll. But if you can tell that story and help them feel like they're involved in the movement, then they're, they have that equity associated with the brand, and they're more willing to take action. And then the other thing is understanding how to master engagement. A lot of people will ignore or delete negative comments on social media. Those are my favorite ones to take and spin. Because if you can spin that, people will then say, oh man, I love how he responded to this comment or I love how she responded to that criticism that was on her post. I do this on every single one of my posts. Anytime, I, I do not delete comments on, on TikTok unless there's ex explicit, ex expletives, expletives, thank you. Um, inside of the, the post, then I'll delete them. But uh, for the most part, I like to take negative engagement, spin that around, turn a conversation, and then prompt a response from that person because I got three comments out of that one comment. And so then that triples that engagement from those interactions with those people. Um, so this is my tech stack that I use as a creator. Number one, story. Connor, thank you. Seriously, story, I'm not, like, this is not like a we did not intentionally say this. Connor just said, give us a shout out if that's cool. I've been using Story for over a year. I locked in the partnership. Uh, actually, it happened right here at a Silicon Slopes event. Connor approached me and said, hey, we'd like to help out with the content strategy for Silicon Slopes. So I've been working with Story for over a year now using the product. I've got the app on my phone, $8.99 a month for unlimited video edits. No joke, it probably saves me 30 to 50 video, or 30 to 50 hours a month in content creation and video editing. Um, so absolutely love working with the story team. Unlimited video editing for $8.99 a month, which is an absolute steal. N yeah, $900. $8.99.99, depends on how you spin it. Yeah, yeah. I think you have a few other packages, right? Yeah, lower and higher. Um, and that's short form and long form. Um, so, a total win there. Platforms that I use, LinkedIn, TikTok, and Instagram. Those are the three that I use. I take the same content that I create on TikTok, I use an app called tickmate.app, and I download the video without a watermark, and then I repost the exact same thing to Instagram Reels. Doesn't need to be more complicated than that. It's the same exact content, and then most of the time I'll take that content, turn it into written format, and I'll repost that to LinkedIn. Uh, and then there are some original things that I'll just post to LinkedIn that I won't post to, to TikTok or Instagram. 
Um, and then I also use a, a, a platform called ePipe, which my friend Jed Morley owns, uh, which is like Linktree, but on steroids, because you get data on every single scroll, click, link, and viewership. You can see, basically treat your link in bio as a funnel to see where people are dropping off, where people are clicking into. Um, so a really cool company, ePipe, that I use for all my analytics. Um, Scan this video, Story is giving away a free, or scan this QR code, Story is giving away a free video edit to anyone that's here. And if you're watching this back on that camera, scan it. I don't know if it'll work, but Dave, if you can cut to like a shot of the screen, that'd be great, and then they can scan it on their computers. Um, but scan this, they'll do a free video edit, short form uh, for you guys' video platforms. Um, and then a couple reminders just when it comes to short form video platforms before we get into written content. Engage with every comment within the first 24 hours of being up. Second one is treat every video as someone's first interaction with your profile. And that, that goes for written content as well. Don't, don't create content that's like, oh man, you know, it's, it's back and we're doing this and you're like already too far into the story that someone that's never heard of you is automatically disassociated with the story. Treat every single video like it's someone's first time viewing your video. Um, or viewing your content so that they can associate and feel like they have skin in the game and be part of that story or the series that you're running. And then your last one is treat, or your content should tell a consistent story. If your content expects to see X and you show them Y, they're gonna scroll, they're not gonna engage. So your, your goal is to understand your who, where they're at, how you reach them, and what your content should be, and understanding those people so well that you can deliver on what you know that they want and that you, can deliver, that you can deliver on what you know that they don't know that they want. To be able to then know that audience so well that you're continually delivering content they're, they're gonna consume and engage with. Channel strategy. Uh, you can never plan to go viral. You can only plan your response to virality. So whenever, I, I like to have like a little repository of content ideas that I would use if I ever go viral. So for example, I was working at a SaaS startup. We didn't go viral until our, it was like our 43rd video. And then right after that video, we put into play the action of the different videos that we wanted to make sure that as people saw that content and went viral, what did I want people to see right after that video went viral to maximize that engagement? So we talked about product features, we talked about the benefits, how it would save people time, the different things that's gonna latch on to someone and make them make a purchase decision. But you can never plan to go viral, as much as anyone will say, the algorithm's gonna have final say over how your content performs. You can only do as much as you possibly can it's up to that algorithm. But once a piece of content does, and it will inevitably go viral eventually, plan your response to virality and the content that you're gonna spin up after that content that does go viral. Um, so strategies uh, for brands and personal brands, uh, just a brief overview, TikTok strategy, create content around the four content pillars and 80-20 series and trends. Give people a reason to come back. So at that AI startup that I was at, we had a, a platform that you could upload a photo and it tell you, based on millions of photos that we had analyzed using AI, it would tell you how that post would perform on Instagram before it was actually posted. And so what we would do is we created a series called Engagement Concepts and gave people in different industries different ideas of what they could post. And then we created a series so that if they came in on video 18 of the series, they would then go back and watch the rest of the series to get other ideas and inspiration. So creating 80% uh, series, 20% trends. Don't be the brand or the individual that just hops on the trends that everyone else is creating. Try to be the trend setter in creating content that people are, that people are gonna replicate. Um, short form video, storytelling is winning. Create a new page and curate your For You page on TikTok. Uh, when you first create a page, first thing you should do is go out and find 100 creators in the niche that you're in and go follow them and engage with their content. Because that's those are all signals that are indicating to the algorithm who you want your content to go to. Uh, establish the competitor profiles that we talked about for inspiration, and then make three videos that talk about you or your brand, the ethos of who you are and why you do what you do, and pin those to the top of your profile so that people can get an immediate snapshot of who you are and what you do. Instagram strategy, cross-post content from TikTok to Instagram Reels. Utilize memes. Yes, memes, they work very well, especially for SaaS startups, but they have to be good. Don't make bad memes. Um, people love old people, especially in memes. So if you can find a way to integrate old people into memes, I promise you it works. 
I know it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but it works. Uh, optimize your bio, stories, Instagram highlights, and then long form videos as needed. Uh, and then the last one is LinkedIn strategy for the company and then also for your individual. LinkedIn really doesn't like company pages and I will die on that hill. I think that LinkedIn should be used for personal brands, but I do think it's important to have a, a polished brand presence on LinkedIn. So make sure you have a photo for your company, make sure you have a header, make sure you have a website linked, make sure that nothing's broken, just make sure that the, the platform is there. And then on your, uh, your LinkedIn strategy for the founder or for the individual that's representing the company, uh, establish a similar content strategy with your pillars, focuses. That's what I call them, the four pillars, the, f the four focuses, focuses. Thank you. Um, I didn't hear a very good laugh back there. Yeah, he didn't like that one. He didn't like that one. Um, all right, we'll work on that one. Um, and then becoming a thought leader on the problem that your company and product solves, and then use it to network and get feedback. Do not cold pitch. Like, please. They're build a relationship with someone before you just do an outreach and, and ask for something. Uh, you'd be surprised how much higher your response rate will be and how much higher your hit rate will be when you actually build a friendship and relationship. Um, and then LinkedIn best practices, before you ever make a post, just get to 500 connections. That'll make it seem like your profile is actually legit. That's like your rite of passage into LinkedIn. Get to 500 connections. If you're a CEO or a manager, encourage your employees to be on LinkedIn. Uh, and give them guidelines and things to share. Do not be a helicopter parent if you're a CEO or a manager. Do not. Yes, it's okay to give criticism and ideas and critique, but do not watch like a hawk every single post that, you're, that your people are creating. It disincentivizes them to be active on the platform, which is going to do more harm to your brand because they're not actively seeking out and helping your brand by creating content. And don't sell. Engage through conversation, ask questions, and then if it makes sense, Maybe, maybe ask them if they want to buy your product. Maybe. I'm still hesitant to even say maybe. Um, this is my favorite LinkedIn hack. When I was first growing my initial personal brand, um, I, would, I would do the, I call it the PMP, uh, the post meeting post. And the most important thing is that this has to be authentic. You cannot fabricate this. This has to be authentically used and authentically created. But essentially, in essence, uh, you have a meeting with someone, you go to lunch with someone, you learn something great, take notes. Uh, ask if you can take a picture with them afterwards or just make a post after and say, I just had a great lunch with Levi Lindsay and we talked about everything Kano dog and dog collars. Uh, we talked everything shift global. We talked, you know, manufacturing, supply chain. And I learned so much, walked away with so many different ideas. So grateful. If you're not connected to Levi, you need to go connect with Levi right now. And one, it, it does one of two things. It does genuine goodwill, but it has to be authentic. You have to create authentic connections and interactions with these people because if you don't have that authentic connection, then it's just going to seem like you're, you're spamming them, right? And you're, you're, you're trying, you have your own agenda that you're trying to get across. The other thing that it does, though, is by tagging them in that post, it actually then pushes onto their entire follower page. And so your brand is then exposed to a whole new audience. And so if there's alignment, you'll also get inbound connection requests through LinkedIn because you tagged this person. But my favorite thing to do, there's no better way to use LinkedIn than to highlight individuals in your company or individuals in the community by giving authentic and genuine goodwill and love and sharing that trust within a community and a network. That's, build, that's how you build authentic connections. So uh, if you're going to use it well, use the PMP, the post meeting post. Um, Silicon Slopes is a use case. Uh, the platforms that we used uh, when I was here at Silicon Slopes uh, was TikTok and Instagram Reels, Instagram, LinkedIn, primarily for personal brands, and YouTube, where we'd post podcasts, uh, interviews, uh, event recaps from Silicon Slopes Summit, Hall of Fame. Um, but what I learned working at Silicon Slopes was how to build a community. It was the best place that I'd ever seen a community of thousands of thousands of professionals aligned on in a variety of different industries that we're all willing to connect. There is now living in Indiana, I can tell you there's nothing like Silicon Slopes out there. So I feel fortunate that I had time to spend here because there's so many people in this room that are willing to connect and engage and work together rather than feel like everyone's competing and working against each other. So our four pillars when we were working, uh, when I was helping out with social media here, uh, we would focus on the stories of startups and the individuals inside of the Silicon Slopes ecosystem. Uh, we would uh, share content from our various different events, the weekly events, the Friday conversation series, uh, interviews on the, the Meat and Potatoes podcast at the time, uh, recaps from speakers at Silicon Slope Summit, 
Uh, we would share those podcast interviews about topics and relevant to the audience. And then the last one with genuine goodwill is celebrating the successes and the good people inside of the Silicon Slips ecosystem. And it worked really well. Uh, we changed our strategy just a little bit to focus on sharing content from the personal brand page. Rather than posting just from the Silicon Slopes page, uh, the thought that we had was, man, it would be really interesting to see how people would res respond if we could associate the personal brand with this movement. Rather than just posting from Silicon Slopes and we, no one knew who was behind the page, we were posting celebration of the community from uh, Clint's page. We were talking about podcasts from Garrett's page, talking about with the, the variety of different sponsors and community partners and celebrating those companies from John Bowers' page. And the numbers that we saw were incredible. In the previous 90-day period before we implemented this personal brand strategy, we saw 200,000 impressions on LinkedIn. The next 90 days as we increased and changed the strategy from posting from the personal page, or from the, from the company page to the personal brand, we saw an increase to 1.2 million impressions in a 90-day period. And so the only shift was that we shifted from taking it from the company page to sharing it from the personal brands that people could associate with and identify with and have an authentic connection with. And what we saw was a, an incredible interaction and community built uh, on the platform, off the platform, people coming to, an event, uh, coming to an event, and it just seemed like the community was a little bit more active as we were focusing more on the personal one-to-one -one interactions through content. Um, all right, last section. I know this has been a fire hose and a fire hydrant, but the last section I wanna talk about is working with influencers and creators. Um, so breaking this down into three sections, there's three spots that I focus on with my brands, UGC and CGC, which is user-generated content and creator-generated content, uh, paid campaigns and affiliates. So I myself have done each of these. I, I keep a creative spin and I work with a, a UGC agency to work with brands to create content for them so that I can get ideas of how to create content. Um, campaigns are purely transactional. You hope that it's gonna perform. Um, you can pay the small price of $20,000 for a really good sponsor post from Levi Lindsay, and it'll perform really well. Uh, and then affiliates doing a revenue share, base pay, and they have skin in the game for the content to perform. Uh, example with UGC videos. This is how I source UGC creators. I make a post on Twitter. There's a community of UGC creators that'll make a video for 50 bucks and free products. So this is the exact outline that we use. My partners and I just launched a supplement line. We aren't putting, we don't have a ton of time to focus on creating like organic content right now. And so we're working with creators to create that content for us. So what I did, create a post that says, looking for your uh, UGC creators. This is about the brand, what we're doing. There's payment involved and we'll give you free product. And I hadn't posted on probably two years on Twitter and I got just under 100 replies from different creators that wanted to work with that and we hired multiple people from that. And then we did the same thing with this energy drink company out of St. George that I'm working with with their influencer strategy um, and did the same thing and we saw the same result. We had a, 117 responses to that uh, and then I think, we, I think we walked away with having 10 to 15 different creators that are now creating content. Really good way, again, if you're gonna spend budget somewhere, let people take creative license and work with it. I think most people with a product could probably budget $500 to have 10 different creators create videos around the product and see what works. If it performs, throw a budget behind it and turn it into a paid strategy. Um, if you want, this is also in that resource folder. This is a folder with 50 different UGC videos that I've made for different companies from supplement lines to a meditation bench to SaaS softwares to drink companies to everything that you can think of. But if you're looking for some inspiration, this is all just inside of that Google Drive folder. You can scan the, the QR code and that'll, be, that'll all be inside there with the slides. And then there's also a couple different resources that I've put together that I use uh, that are all inside of that folder. Um, but that is everything in the fire hose of content and organic social. I do wanna take a little bit of time to talk about Q&A, talk about your brands, what you guys are working on, what questions you have, and then how we can come up with a strategy. April, how much time do we have for a Q&A? Uh, three, three hours, that's great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Let's do 10 to 15 minutes maybe of Q&A. Um, couple ideas here up on the board, uh, but feel free to ask away and let's just have a little bit of a conversation. Yeah, right here. Hold on. Don't move. Wait. What's your name? Christine. Thanks for coming. Sorry, this is for the recorded audio. Oh, yes. All right, Christine. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So you mentioned we're looking to expand on the TikTok, but we haven't done it yet. Limited resources is kind of a challenge. You mentioned that you'll take your TikTok, 
TikTok and just post it to Instagram. Do you find it affects your engagement just using the same video? Have you tested it all? Yes. You have to make sure it doesn't have the TikTok watermark. So yeah. if you're repo if you're just if you just hit save on TikTok, it'll save the video with the TikTok watermark. Mm -hmm. Instagram put a new rollout about a year ago and they have AI that can detect that watermark and it'll kill the video immediately. But you don't see any other like engagement issues with using the exact No, nope, cuz I have some videos that'll perform really well on TikTok that don't perform well on Instagram, okay. and then I have other videos that'll perform that I posted to TikTok that don't perform that will perform on Instagram. So you'd recommend like starting with the TikTok one and then posting yeah. the other I po one, the exact same stuff. content I post on both. Okay. I copy over the caption, copy over the hashtags, the location that I tagged in it, everything's the exact same between okay. the two platforms. Cool. Um, what's your company? What do you guys do? Uh, unique. So, yep. Okay. The MLM. <laughs> Perfect. So, ha are you guys working with creators right now? What is your creator? I mean, we have like? a huge base of distributors, and they're pretty happy to create like UGC type content for us. So it's not hard to get that kind of content out there. Yep. It's mostly challenging. It's like how we can position things because we can't step into what they're doing as right. well. So. It's not necessarily direct to consumer with your yeah. model. It's a little bit of a different play there. Yeah. But I think general brand awareness, um, I shared a few ideas actually with doTERRA on a similar model, um, but focusing specifically on just bringing awareness to the product and then pushing for an initiative to find uh, local representation that they could then get in contact. But what we would do, uh, and what I would recommend is if you make a post, actually have that as a list, have a list of your distributors that you work with and send those links out to them, commenting on the video saying, hey, I'm in this area, I'm in Pleasant Grove, Utah. If anyone's interested in buying products from Unique, feel free to send me a DM, right? And just get that engagement so that people know how they can get in contact with people. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's the challenge of the location stuff with tech stuff too, yep. but cool. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. we deal with the same thing with Cold Plunge, right? Because we only have one physical location right now. Um, we do own the, the trademark Cold Plunge and Cold Plunge Studios, and so right now what we're just doing is building brand awareness. We're maybe going to see a lot of people that do not live in Indianapolis proper, but we do have 100 people waiting for franchise information, and so when we expand into franchises, that brand equity will be there and it's built so that when that spot is ready, we can then roll into it. But uh, any other questions? Yeah, right here. Yeah, uh, how do you feel about multiple different, uh, multiple different, let's say, Instagram pages for different brands. So for Here Brotherhood, we have our main page, and then we just launched our podcast a couple of weeks ago. And I want to be putting a bunch of clips on, but I don't want to overdo it on the main page. Post it to the main page. Post it to the main page, so don't do a separate page. My favorite creators are the ones that post their podcast content to their main page. I'm not going to go follow two pages. I'm just going to see the content in the feed, right? And so if it's natively going to be there and it's interesting, I'm going to engage with it right there. Most people, like the reality of it is most people don't have post notifications on. And so it's not going to bug them. It's just going to be another feed. It's going to be another post that pops up in the feed. So I wouldn't overthink it. I, I would just keep it on the same page. Because okay. then you have to worry about rebuilding a whole second brand and rebuilding it. And then you're like, what page, what clip should I post to this but not post this? It's like, just live it under one. It'd be a lot easier for you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, right back here. Love your content. Thanks. Thank so, you. we all know it's great to have like millions and millions of views and there's a lot of engagement. However, by the end of the day, the transactions don't really open on social media unless you do TikTok shops and stuff, right? And we also know that these content platforms, they really don't want you to leave the platform because they want your data there. So, we've been trying to find ways to get people who are interested in your content and how do you get them to go to your website, whatever it is, without paying ads. Because if you pay ads, they let you link out. If you don't pay ads on, um, say, Instagram, you, you have to do it through LinkedIn bio, or if you do story, then you have a link sticker. I don't know much about TikTok, how do you send traffic out? So the question is, how do you effectively send the warm leads, interest people out of social to your platform where the transaction could happen? Really good question. Um, I, I haven't tested it on TikTok, but there's a, an app out there called ManyChat. Some of you may have used it, some of you may have not. Um, Instagram doesn't like when you use the, the link feature in the story, right, or link in bio. And so what I would recommend is set up an, a, an automation and a trigger through ManyChat. You, it's a really cool platform. We use it for cold plunge, for example. So when anyone comments, if we have a, right now we're running a campaign where if anyone comments the word cold on one of our videos, it sends them an automatic video or an automatic message to their DM from the comment. 
gives them a link to register, and then gives them the checkout link right there. And so create that integration through messages and try to find ways to integrate many chat instead of trying to redirect that traffic. Um, it, it's really hit or miss, and frankly, if the content is convincing enough, those people are gonna take action. If it's not convincing enough, they're not gonna take action. But a, a good way to kind of get around that feeling like you're like shadow banned um, is to use that many chat feature to create that integrated automation for responses. Many chat's awesome. You can you can create as many integrations and automations as you want. Does that help? Yeah, we're good. Cool. Uh, does that also work on LinkedIn or just on I don't Instagram? know if they have that on LinkedIn. Just Instagram right now? Okay. Product idea there. Someone's going to start that. I'll take 25%. Um, yeah, right here. The, so my question is, how much content are you uh, producing using like native app features compared to, like I'm really intrigued with Connor's company. I've seen the billboard, been to their website a couple times. Today's the first day I'm meeting him. But um, producing, having somebody, uh, whether it's a company or an individual, producing content outside of those platforms compared to using those in native app features? So I'll break this answer down in two different ways. One, people often over glamorize having a million different tools to use. Like you saw my tech stack, I have like three platforms that I use, in addition to the platforms that I actually like post on. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason that I genuinely love working with Story is you get to set the brand guidelines of how they create your videos. So you get to choose the colors, you get to create how much animations on the screen or how little animations on the screen and your whole goal is just to make sure that the video is not distracting to the end user. Creating them natively inside the app or creating them using an outside source, whether that be CapCut, whether that be a video editor in Premiere in Adobe, whether that be using a platform like Story, I haven't noticed a difference in engagement based on where those videos are created. Your whole goal is just to make sure that your video is not distracting but most platforms won't let you create that brand identity. That's why I actually really love working with Story, because they let you decide what parameters you set on how that content is created. Does that help? Great answer. All right. Yeah, right here. Uh, hi. Um, so one of the questions we've had as a company is how to get more UGC content because we're a service-based company. We're so we represent zero res, and we go into homes to provide that service, and it's higher value. So it's hard to say. $50 and here's a product when we can't ship anything. We have to actually provide a service and we have to pay the technicians and we, there's a lot of things kind of in the way of getting consistent UGC content. And so do you have any ideas for us? Take a look at your top 50 customers of who have spent the most money with you. Then comb through that list and see if any of them have Instagram or LinkedIn. If any of them have a remote presence, Ask them if they'd be willing to help you create a video. You craft it, you come up with the script, you come up with the idea, make it super easy for them, and then say, we'll give you $250 off your next service, and offer them the discount through that. And then that incentivizes them to keep the brand communication between them. But I would keep that relationship, because you're already giving back to the people that are passionate about the product. So with a service business, I would take those top 10, 15, 20, give back to them, but then use them as your ambassadors that you're creating content with. Does that help? Yeah. Awesome. I saw one back here and then one right here. Yeah, we got time for about two more. Okay, two more. We'll just we'll just share it together. Um, one and a half. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Um, so you were talking a lot about like um, tagging people and then also having hashtags on there. There's a lot of people that will post and they'll just put on they'll just tag like tons and tons of people or they'll put on tons of hashtags. Like what what have you seen that has been like very engaged? engaging to have like a certain number of tags of people or uh, tagging companies or hashtags that really is effective so you don't feel like you're overwhelming people with that kind of stuff. I never like to put more than five, I call them clickables, never like to put more than five clickables in a post. And that's usually three hashtags and two tags. So if I'm going to tag someone, like if it, uh, for example, I made a, a post last week talking about I have this series that I like to post on LinkedIn that says if I could buy stock in five people's companies or in five individuals, this is who I'd buy stock in. And then I'd highlight five people that I think are great up and comers inside the industry. Josh was mad that I didn't shout him on that last one. It's a, we're good. Yeah, uh, Matt, sorry, why did I say Josh? You look like Josh at Mercado. Sorry, apologies. Um, so yeah, Matt was, I'll get you on the next one, don't worry. Um, so if you have more than five clickables, what it is, again, all the way back to, to video content, it's just confusing. And then it's just like, 
what does this person actually want me to post? When people are tagging 30 people or 30 hashtags, what they're really hoping is that all of those people will engage with that content. What I usually do is turn notifications off for this post, right? Because if I'm tagged on that, I'm just getting flooded with notifications and content that I didn't create. So what I would recommend is if you're gonna tag someone, make it very tactical and don't have more than five clickables. So usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll have three hashtags if I'm highlighting an individual, I'll have their name tagged and I'll have the company that they work at, and that's it. If it's gonna be anything else, I'm highlighting multiple individuals or multiple companies, and they only have those two things inside of the post. But don't spam tag, it, I promise it doesn't work. Garrett, do you have a question? Yeah, man. Um, you had mentioned LinkedIn isn't the most friendly for businesses. Um, they're looking at those personal pages more. Uh, more. Um, what platforms would you suggest are very business centric that they'll actually highlight posts? Um, the, the best that I would say is actually building a Facebook group. Uh, if you open your Facebook page right now, like I guarantee if I opened it, I would not see a single post from a friend. Actually, this is a new phone and I'm not logged into Facebook. But um, you'll only see posts from groups on Facebook. Um, so curating a group around a specific topic and then saying presented by KJ, for example, right? So if, you're, if you want to create an audience or community of people that are looking to staff their company with augmented staffing solutions like KJ does, for example, I would create a, a community around culture and placement and people in those roles presented by KJ and then offering your services in a discount to that group. Um, a Facebook group, honestly, is probably your best bet or direct outreach through conversation using LinkedIn. So a lot of people, like I'll tell a lot of my friends, it's like, hey, if you have someone that you want to get in contact with and you see that I'm connected with, send me an email if I know them well enough or send me a text, I will do a personal introduction and send that over because that's the best way to get business done. Um, but doing that specifically through LinkedIn connections is the best way to do that. Um, but I would say it's a little bit harder with being business friendly, specific like in KJ's situation, right, with augmented staffing. I'd probably say your best bet is creating a community of people looking for staffing uh, and then engaging through personal introductions and interactions with people. We had a lot of great questions from the fellas. Uh, any gals have one, one last question? Okay, perfect. Hi, okay, so Hello. you mentioned uh, the face, like close Facebook groups with the with the different demographics coming in as like the purchasing power with like in TikTok and Instagram, do you foresee the, these closed Facebook groups dying? Do you foresee them still being used? What are your thoughts around that? Facebook, uh, sorry, they want us to call it Meta now. Um, <laughs> Facebook will never die. So the reality of it is, is there's always going to be engaged traffic, and the natural audience on Facebook is an older, more purchase power and decision maker power it does just take a lot more work to build a Facebook community because at that point you're a community manager as well. Um, but in Unique's example, right, creating an, an audience of distributors and also different people that are passionate about the product then you can have distributors invite people to that community, you can do a one-to-one-to-one-to-many one -to -one -to route by having people invite their friends into the community and then you guys host and manage. Um, I don't think Facebook will ever die, um, but that's because it's, it's a legacy platform. Um, and I, I think platforms will continually try to, to keep up. There will always be advertising dollars on Facebook and there will always be users on Facebook. Um, and I think just with your, your reach and the ease of creating content, Facebook is a little bit easier than trying to create like a whole Instagram strategy per se, if you can associate dedicated resources to building Facebook. But that's specifically Facebook communities because pages don't work, uh, you know, like personal pages, or any, like it's a lot harder to have those interactions. Groups on Facebook will do really well though, if you can associate the proper resources to it. Fantastic, thank you. You bet. Okay, awesome, let's give them a round of, right. uh, round of applause. <laughs> La last note, this, this QR code has all of the resources, everything I've talked about, and more in there. It's free, I promise. There's no, you don't have to give me your email and hop on my mailing list or anything, but this is good to go. So thank you to the marketing chapter for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we'll also send this out uh, on our channels. Uh, you guys should see it. Um, before I hand it back over to you, April, I just have a, a two quick things. One, there's a lot of pizza left. Again, let's hear it for Story for sharing lunch with us. Yeah. <clears throat> Woo, thank you. Um, Hopefully this was educational, this was fun. Hopefully you've been able to connect, you've been able to network. Um, the Still Can Slopes Marketing Summit that's coming up in April, I wanna do one quick plug for that. 
Um, I know we already talked briefly about it, but I wanted to say this. Um, every dollar that's coming from that event is being reinvested back into this group, into the marketing chapter. So if you haven't heard about it, um, it is, it's a conference for marketers here in Utah. If you think about what conferences are available to Utah marketers right now, there, uh, DMC used to do one, the Digital Marketing Collective. Um, it's kind of died off a little bit, it's not really happening. Um, but if you wanna go to like a legit marketing conference, you have to leave Utah. That blows, that sucks for us. I mean, like there are events like this, there are meetups, there are cool stuff happening, but there's no like legit conference. And so that's something that we wanted to change, uh, and especially since now uh, with the Silicon Slope Summit, the larger event, uh, it's not, they don't really have breakout sessions anymore. And so the Silicon Slopes Marketing Summit is meant to be specifically for that opportunity to learn for marketers to network connect. There's gonna be three different tracks. There's gonna be a B2B track, a B2C track, and a creative track. So that's on April 10th and 11th at the University of Utah. We hope that you can join us. But please know this, then, like I said, all that money is coming back to you guys, and every month when we have these types of events, we're gonna use the funds from that conference to make these events even cooler. Like we're gonna be doing fun activities, we're gonna have giveaways, we're just gonna make these experiences way better. And so what this does, it's 100 bucks to attend, 150 if you want the VIP. And here's, here's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that you can convince your businesses, your bosses, to pay for it. Or if you're the boss, pay for your people to go because, and sponsor it. Yeah. So the, again, then this is how we create sustainability for our chapter, where it starts to pay for itself. Right? The events get better, more people come. Next year, we'll do another marketing summit. It will be even bigger and cooler. And then we'll start attracting out-of-state out -state people to come to that event, which will fund our in-state activities. How freaking cool is that? Like, let's get California and like New York to pay for Utah stuff, right? Um, Anyway, we're trying to create sustainability and to make these events even better. So please come support that event. Uh, it's going to be freaking awesome. Already we have a massive, uh, just really incredible lineup of the, the, the breakouts, uh, sorry, the keynotes, the breakouts, and uh, we've got some comedy shows and stuff that's happening too. So anyway, please check that out. I'm gonna hand it back over to April. So all the information is right here that Pete just talked about, um, but also from today, we'll share everything out from our LinkedIn profile. So if you follow the marketing chapter or myself or Ryan or Pete or Nicole, it will all be there. Um, so we'll share everything with you guys. And please um, feel welcome to like comment, reach out to me. If you have any questions, I'd love to follow up about it, whether it's about the Marketing Summit or about Ryan's um, entire session today. So I wanted to thank you again, Ryan, so, so much for coming and doing this. It was awesome. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. And also, thank you to Story. Thank you.